All right, guys, today is April 16th, 2019. And this is an interesting week in history because there were some pretty hard hits and near misses, which, which I'll tell you about. But first, I want to tell you about a movie I watched a couple nights ago called Stan and Ollie. It's about Laurel and Hardy in their retirement years. Now, if you don't know who Laurel and Hardy are, uh, you may not like this movie because it only recovers, it only tells you about the retirement years and doesn't tell you too much of anything else, so you probably wouldn't get it. Um, I kind of think that they, I think the people who made it kind of did it, did it an injustice, so to speak. But the casting was terrific. Steve Coogan and John C. Riley played the characters, and they couldn't have done any better. They was just they were just fantastic until they really studied the parts. Laurel and Hardy were a comedy duo back in like the 1930s. They made a bunch of movies under the Hal Roach Studios around the same time of Little Rascals and Our Gang, and um, they were. They came on the heels of Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton. So it's that kind of comedy, you know, around the same time as the Marx Brothers. It's very, very good stuff, fun to watch. Um, if you don't know who Laurel and Hardy are, you should check them out. But the movie was good if you know who Laurel and Hardy are. If you don't, it wouldn't be your cup of tea. So anyway, that's my two cents on that. And uh, I, I found something interesting about Hal Roach because it was a Hal Roach Studios that made the Laurel and Hardy movies. Hal Roach lived to be 100 years old. He was born in 1892 and died in 1992. And he said something that I thought was funny. He says my he said my wife converted me to religion. I never believed in hell until I married her. <laughs> okay. So, moving on. April 14th, 1865. April 14th was Sunday for us. But on April 14th, 1865, President Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. Most people know this. I don't really want to elaborate a whole lot on that. There's not a whole lot to tell that I want to cover in this video. But um, I will say that John Wilkes Booth and his co-conspirators didn't just want to take him out. They also had other people in mind within the layers of government. Uh, for instance... On the same night, they tried to kill William Seward, Secretary of State, and Andrew Johnson, the Vice President. And so what they did was they went to William Seward's house where he was feeling sick and laying down. And uh, his assassin-to-be knocked on the door, claimed to have some kind of a message for him. And he insisted on, on delivering it himself to Seward. Uh, so he had to kind of bum rush his way up to him and uh, assaulted some people on the way up, tried to kill, kill about five people in the house that night. He stabbed William Seward eight times, but his, this individual's assassination attempt was thwarted, was foiled. All, all five people survived, believe it or not. William Seward was critically hurt, and another man spent 60 days in a coma from being hit on the head with a pistol, but all five people survived. And Andrew Johnson, even though he ha there was an assassin for him, his assassin chickened out. He just couldn't do it. He was, I think he was Polish, and he was just a, he was known to be a coward. He apparently got drunk, got lost, and it was believed that he might have spent the night in a cemetery. And so that those were near misses. Those are near misses. Nothing. I know I have probably have a smile on my face to, uh, to some degree, but I'm not laughing about the situation. But, but I mean, man, I mean, they. That's why Andrew Johnson became the, the um, 17th president of the United States. Lincoln was killed, and and so he took over that role. But having said that, uh, the co the co conspirators of John Wilkes Booth fled to Mary Surratt's house. They were found out. And Mary Surratt was arrested, and eventually she was the first woman to be executed under federal law. She was hanged. And so, there, there you have that. And certainly got her for that. And there's a lot of debate as to whether she was really guilty or not, by the way. So, anyway, now, on April 15th, April 15th, which was yesterday, uh, the Titanic sunk. Now, most people know what the, what the Titanic is. There's so much hubbub about the Titanic. Uh, 1,517 people died that night. They perished in the waters. And the Titanic was thought to be unsinkable. It was, was 45,000 tons. 
I have 3 million rivets and 16 watertight bulkheads. So it was believed that if there was a compromise in the structure at all, a bulkhead could be um, closed off and then uh, subsequently, you know, the ship could stay afloat. But as we know, that did not happen. Now, I also want to bring this up because I am reading a book right now called The Last Castle by Denise Kiernan. Very good book. It's about George and Edith Vanderbilt. George Vanderbilt built this 175,000 square foot mansion in Asheville, North Carolina, which I have not been to yet. A lot of people have. They say it's magnificent, and it sounds like it is. I want to go there sometime this year. But George and Edith Vanderbilt were supposed to be on the Titanic. Them and some of their relatives. And at the last hour, they changed their mind and boarded the Olympic. Now, imagine that. Now, there's actually a lot of stories like that about the Titanic and also the Lusitania uh, in 1915. And uh, you talk about a narrow miss. But, uh, you know, George Vanderbilt died two years later, but he didn't die in the Titanic. Um, I really thought that when I was reading this book, that's what I was going to find out was that he had. And uh, I've read books on Titanic before, so I was trying to recall, but no, him and Edith Vanderbilt did not die on it. And um, interesting, very narrow miss. And uh, so there you have it. In 1914, and this really has nothing to do with this week, but it's just an interesting story. In Tannenberg, East Prussia, historic battle was fought in which General von Hindenburg uh, led his men to victory over the Russians. And in 1927, they were going to celebrate and pay homage to their military chief, President von Hindenburg, uh, by unveiling a war statue, a, a, memor a memorial to all the fallen soldiers who died at the Battle of Tannenberg. And so this was a pretty big deal. There was 100,000 people that showed up for this. There were six miles of soldiers lined up to pay honor to their military chief. And they were dressed in, uh, there was a lot of them that were dressed in gold braided tunics and plumed helmets to kind of represent the imperial days. And uh, at the time, Hindenburg was about 80 years old. And so while he was there, uh, he, was, he was known, Hindenburg, let me say this, Hindenburg was known for being very calm, cool, collected, but also very genial. He had an awesome mustache too, by the way. You might want to Google some of his pictures. But um, one of his friends next to him said, he says, uh, what do you do when you get excited? Because apparently he didn't appear to ever get excited. And Hindenburg told him, he says, I whistle. And his friend says, but I've never seen you whistle. And Hindenburg said, I never have. And uh, that's, this is a guy who knew how to keep his cool, who knew how to stay calm under pressure, and always knew how to have the bearing of a, of a, of a leader. And um, I thought it was, I, I don't know if there's anything necessary to learn from that. I've talked before about the importance of, of keeping a cool head and, and um, staying calm and, and graceful under pressure. But um, I just thought it was a, kind of a neat story. I thought, I, I thought I'd share it with you. So there you have it. President Von Hindenburg never got excited. Now, uh, having said that, though, I, I kind of came across uh, a couple of other things I wanted to share with you. When Calvin Coolidge was president, he said something that was very interesting before his administration was up. And um, I wanted to, to run it by you guys and see what you thought. And here's what he said. He made a speech, and in one of his speeches he said, Peace and prosperity are not finalities. It is too easy under their influence for a nation to become selfish, selfish and degenerate. This test has come to the United States. Now, under, under Coolidge's administration, this nation was very prosperous. He eliminated billions of dollars in debt. And um, he was known to be very frugal, very efficient. But he said, peace and prosperity are not finalities. 
uh, it is too easy under their influence for a nation to become selfish and degenerate. Think about that. Because this is what exactly what people are always striving for. Financial independence. To them, in their minds, it brings peace and obviously prosperity. And so life is good, right? But keep in mind that once pressure is mitigated or eliminated altogether, people don't necessarily shine. In a lot of cases, they it has a, it has a corrosive effect. Um, people, people, I've well, I've said it before. The shiny man's time is during his greatest adversities. I'm not the one who came up with that. A poet did. But a shining the, the man a man's shining time is is during his greatest adversities because pressure is applied and that's when you get to find out what he's really made of and it's what shapes a man and what's what's what helps him become his very best. In some cases people don't shine, but they certainly don't do it when Everything is going their way, and there is no friction. There is no tension. So the next time you're being tested, life isn't going your way. There's a lot of friction, and um, you wonder why you're not getting a fair shake. Just remember, you're just getting polished. Well, that's all I have to say about that one. Now, Herbert Hoover, the president that came after him, said something funny I wanted to share with you. Where's it at? Page 16 here. Listen to this. I thought this was funny. Here's what Herbert Hoover said one time. He, he said, The president ought to be allowed to hang two men every year without giving any reason or explanation. An old friend asked him, he said, Would two be enough? The president said, Perhaps not. But I could get word to 20 or 30 that they were being considered for the honor. Obviously, he's joking, but that's funny. That's funny. I, you know, can you imagine a president saying that nowadays? The closest one that would come to that is Donald Trump. That's why I like him. And um, that's funny. Nothing really deep here. Nothing really to learn from all this. But it's just good stuff. I hope you guys like this. I hope you found some of the uh, information informative and uh, fun to listen to. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up. And feel free to share it. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. All right. Have a great day. Catch you later. Bye-bye.